Paul, I've often heard the phrase that we are to live in light of eternity, to live every single moment here on earth with eternity in mind. Jonathan Edwards used to pray, God, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. What does that mean, Paul? And how can we do that? How can we live in light of eternity? Well, eternity is a great motivation when properly understood, although it's not the greatest. Um, here, here's the, what we need to realize. Christianity is talking about extraordinary things. We're talking about the meaning of life. We're talking about the consequence of death. We're talking about the judgment throne of God. We're talking about eternity in an, a bliss that we cannot describe or a terror that we cannot even comprehend. So Christianity is talking about extraordinary things. Now, we also know from Ecclesiastes and the full, you know, everything that's in the scripture since Genesis 3 is that we're going to die. We know that. And that um, my life is, is actually so brief. It's like a vapor. It's like a cloud. It's like grass, the flower of the field, so it flourishes. And the wind passes over it. It is no more. So if I have a view of these other things, judgment, eternal consequences, and then I compare eternity to a temporal existence that is like a blip on the screen. The thinking man is going to say, everything I do here must be in light of this extraordinary thing in eternity. Now, the atheist, I believe, is very wrong, but he is at least consistent. This is the only life we have and there's no consequences to it at the end except what you might suffer here. And so um, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Th that is at least worthy of respect in the sense that it's consistent. But when the Christian or someone who professes Christianity says, I embrace these extraordinary things about my humanness, that I'm going to live forever, that there's a judgment, that there's an eternity, and what I do here affects what happens there. What I do during this blip on the screen is going to determine what happens to me throughout endless eternity. A person who says that, but then lives in a manner that's contrary to it, there's no consistency there. There's no, it's, it's an absurdity, it's irrational. And so what do we need to do? We need to constantly be laying these things before men. And those theologians who have said, you know, eternity stamped on my eyeballs, it wasn't just for them. It was eternity stamped so that other people saw eternity. One of the jobs of the preacher is to constantly set before the people, there are these extraordinary things headed your way and that your best life now is not that important. Because if your best life is now, that means your eternity is hell, you see. And so th that's one of the sad things is the tendency that is applauded today. And I would say the greater portion of evangelicalism is teach me how to live in this life where the reformers, the Puritans, the early evangelicals was, yes, we can learn to live blessed before God in this life. But this is not the issue. The issue is prepare to meet thy God. Yeah. So that's where we are. So you mentioned to, to live in light of eternity is a great motivation. Yes. But you said, Paul, that it is not the greatest motivation. Right. What is then the greatest motivator for the follower of Christ? We have to be very careful about the statement live in light of eternity. Yeah. Because what we're doing is we're talking about our own welfare. Obey God, uh, which of course is believing the gospel. Obey God so that it goes well with you in eternity. Now there's nothing wrong with that. Yet at the same time, that is all about you. The greater motivation is this. Live for Christ. Live for the one who died for you. and. 
uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we see this. We see what I always call uh, the sun and the moon, the greater light and the lesser light. And in, in verse 10, we see the lesser light. Paul says, well, in verse 9, he says, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Then he gives the reason, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So that was a motivation for Paul. But it wasn't the greatest motivation for Paul. It wasn't about Paul thinking about his self-preservation or his eternal reward. His greatest motivation is found later in verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. Not Paul's love for Christ, which all our love, and Paul was similar, it can be fickle, can be dynamic, ever-changing. Um, he's not talking about Paul's love for Christ motivated him, but Christ's love for Paul. And so for us, our motivation in this life, of course, is eternity and judgment. But our great motivation is for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God loves me. Christ loves me. And this is how it has been shown to me through Calvary. And this is the thing that constrains me. And so, you know, on the Internet, sometimes it's like I lament the fact that it's only my controversial, you know, really hard re rebuking sermons that become popular. I spend the greater part of my time trying to teach Christians the love of God in Christ, because when they grasp that, remember what I said about the, the frail, frightened man in the jungle? Why was he there? Because Christ loved him. And he was willing to do something that was far out of his comfort zone. So the great motivation for me is not eternity. It's Calvary. Eternity is a motivation, but it's what Christ has already done. I think it's safe to say, even though I wouldn't say that my spirituality keeps me in this place. Uh, my spirituality is not worth talking about. But if there were no eternity and all we had was this life, what Christ did should still be a great motivation. I mean, this is the love of God that he gave his son. He gave his son. That is the thing that controlled Paul, that, that just bewildered Paul, that set Paul on fire. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. Paul, well, you know, what you said is that the anthem of even just my time with you in the last few days has been the love of God. It's right. a, a redundant, consistent, intentional theme right. in your conversations and in your preaching. How would you respond to someone that goes, I theologically agree that God loves me. They look at you, Paul, I look at you and go, well, that love is precious. How can the love of God become, if it's the motivator, if it's the compelling force, how can it be re more real to me and how can it be more precious to me, that love of God? First of all, the well, the first place you want to run and stay is Calvary. I, I decided, you know, I'm not a great academic. I'm not a great, I, I wanted to ask myself when I was a young man, I don't have the mind that I can know everything. I don't understand a lot about eschatology. There's so many things. With my limited academics and my limited IQ, if I had to set my sights on knowing one thing, what would it be? And it was the cross of Christ. And I have studied many times hours and hours a day. I have written probably three, four thousand pages of notes. Just the cross. Just this one person, Jesus. And things that probably never be published, won't, but that's it. The more you come to understand who this person was who died and then how he suffered and died. It, it, it's a controlling thing. It is a controlling, immensely controlling thing. 
and then, but what you need to also understand, you know, we all have our times where we lament our lack of passion, our lack of drive. Remember always, and if, if I could say anything to the young Christians, th there's a person, young lady that has over the last few years would, would come and talk to me and, and say, and all the evidence in the world points to the fact that she's such a genuine believer. But she so struggles at times. And there's one thing I always am telling her. Remember, there's only one hero in this story. If I look at my love for Christ, it would, it would only earn me an eternity separated from him. If I look at the times when I'm flaming in a pulpit, just passion, and then my heart just there's a drought in the hotel room or there's only one hero in this story and it's not a man. It's not a super saint. There are no super saints. There's one hero. And, and when you realize that, that it's our elder brother who did everything, that increase, even when I look in the mirror and I see my failure, it increases my understanding of Christ's love for me which then motivates me even more. The, the, my best deed, my best thought, if it could be called out, and that was the only thing for which I was judged, it would only earn me hell. It is the Son. Everything was made for Him. Redemption is for Him. Everything is for Him. And so, yes, I, I don't want young people to look at me in this interview and go, oh, I wish I had his kind of passion. You don't need my kind of passion. You need to go far beyond me. I'm a, I'm a pygmy when it comes to spirituality. Don't look at somebody's passion. Look at their Christ. He's the only thing worth looking at. You know, when people get to know me, they're oftentimes very disappointed. Not because of, I don't think, hypocrisy but just because I'm normal, I'm average. It's like, you know, when there's an accident and the police say, you know, just keep going, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. There's nothing to see here. It's Christ. Everything is Christ. And oftentimes for the young people, they all think, you know, if I can only reach this certain level like this other guy, then God will use me. God always chooses the runt of the litter. If I have been used at all in my years of serving him, it's only because God looks for a Gideon hiding in a wine vat, the least of the least, so that he can say, because he told Gideon when he amassed that army, no, it's too big, because if, I, if, if, if you have victory, you'll attribute it to you. People will attribute it to you. We got to call the army. If he'd have sent out not a little David, but a big Saul to take on Goliath, it would have been Saul. So God always looks for the runt of the litter, and it's the only thing I ever qualified for. So, and Paul said, you know, I, you know, I boast in my weakness. You know, and, and, and that's what I want people to do. Yes, we need to strive to be godly. We need to strive to be devoted. We need to sometimes lament our lack of worship and all these things. But, but that's not the issue. Don't be self-absorbed. What you need to do is just keep looking at Christ. This magnificent, infinitely magnificent person. Look at him. And that's all you're required to do. The ends of the earth are not called to look in the mirror. The ends of the earth are called to look to him. And, and never stop looking. As many old men and Puritans have said, for every inward glance, give 10 long gazes upon Christ. And even as you're saying the love of God is what is compelling us, it also produces, obviously, even in your own life, a gratitude. Yeah. And there's a thankfulness which is accompanied with a joy, a real joy, that serving him is best and it's what he deserves yes you know it's like i shared this morning my favorite one of my favorite stories in in the whole bible is is peter in that boat 
when, not when he walks on the water, or anything, it's when Jesus does the miracle and he says, depart from me, I'm, I'm a wicked man. And, and what he's saying is that, Lord, I should not be here. I should not be allowed to see this. I should not be granted this privilege. Your, your kindness, it's almost wrong. It just seems wrong. And as we grow in love, I have found myself at times in the night watch or something, you know, after preaching and going back to a hotel room or and maybe God's done something and or you're just up at night and you see something in scripture you've never seen before about grace. And you just when you think about all the kindnesses of God to you, that here's a enemy of God, Paul Washer, enemy of God, even till today, uh, often self-absorbed, often so many wrong things about him. And yet this this never changing loving kindness. And you almost just want to go, Lord, this is this doesn't even seem right. And it only is right because of Calvary, because he died for everything that I'm not. Every trespass, every iniquity, every sense of being lackadaisical about God. There's only one hero in this story, and if the young people could only see him and then walk in that. One hero, Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sin. And that's, you know, it, it, you know, in heaven, it's not like you're not going to walk around with, you know, he's got a shirt on that says great preacher or great missionary or great this. I think if, if there were jerseys in heaven, it would just be saved. Saved. How did you get here? Him. You know, one day in heaven, you know, I'm not going to be walking down the street with you, let's say, and... uh and I see a bunch of people and I say, hey, everybody, come here, come here. I want to tell you about all the things Johnny did for Christ. I'm so excited. I want to tell you about all the things he did for Christ. That's not going to happen. What I want to do is go, hey, hey, I'll tell you everything Christ did for him. I'll tell you about everything Christ did for me. We're only recipients. And even if, even if you give your life as a martyr, you serve in the mission field, not I, but the grace of God did it. One boast. You remember Romans 3, shut every mouth with regard to self-boasting, to open every mouth to boasting only in Christ. That's, that's, that's what it is. He's the hero. The, always. And his love is real. Yes, it's real. It is real. It is real. And that's why sometimes it is important, very important to see the doctrine of sin. But it's also important. I hate when I fail. I, I, I don't want to fail him. But I have found that even my failure serves a purpose. In that it is a constant reminder there's only one hero. There's only grace. And, you know, um, on sanctification, people always attribute, they think of sanctification as growing in holiness, and that's what it is. I don't want to take away from that for a second. When I look at my progress in holiness over the last three decades, I would honestly tell you I thought I would be much further. I thought when I was younger, I would be more holy. But there is one aspect of holiness, of sanctification, that has grown like a rocket. And that is my recognition of my absolute need of Calvary and grace. I am, I mean, it was just a kernel when I got saved in and now, as the years progress and all the times that that I failed, all the times that it was, you know, 
two steps forward and three steps back all the times. It, it just now I realized, look, it's all him. And I said that when I was saved and I believed it. But the fullness of it, that it's, it's all Christ, one hero. Yeah. And enlarge more now than yes. ever for you. And then as you... You understand your sin. God's love becomes more amazing. Yes. His grace more unthinkable. And then service to him, yeah. the only rational right. response. So, Paul, thank you, you so much. So helpful and challenging for yeah. me. I, I appreciate your earnestness. You're saying nothing to see here. Yeah. But I'm also mindful of Paul saying, follow me as I follow Christ. And yeah. as we watch just your earnestness, I want I want to imitate that. Yeah. I want to imitate Christ and I'm watching you strive after that. So thank you for your yeah. time. Just let it flow Summer mornings feel so bright Sunshine beams in your eyes so light Every step we take feels so free You and I, we hold the key Gimme, give gimme give that can't sleep crush Hearts on fire, it's way too much Butterflies take over my mind Stay with me, let's rewind time Maybe hold your hand a little tight Whisper secrets in the fading light Take a chance High. They are you, it's swirl and sway Laughter rings, we chase the gray Sparks ignite in midnight air Love is magic everywhere Gimme, give gimme give that kiss, sweet crush Hearts on fire, it's way too much Butterflies take over my mind Stay with me, let's rewind time Summer dream with you by my side, it all seems real. 